From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, and I hear everything production. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. We'll unearth the real-world experiences of some of the brightest minds in the marketing and technology space so you can learn the tools, tips, and tricks they've learned along the way. Now here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast. I'm Benjamin Shapiro, the executive producer of the MarTech Podcast, and today we've got a special episode for you, which is going to be guest hosted by Juan Mendoza, the author of the MarTech Weekly Newsletter. Juan is a recovering MarTech consultant turned creator who writes an amazing weekly newsletter about the MarTech industry. And I'm thrilled to invite him and some of his friends to take the mic and share their knowledge with you, our loyal MarTech Podcast listeners. All right, here's a special episode of the MarTech Podcast, guest hosted by Juan Mendoza, the author of the MarTech Weekly Newsletter. Hello, hello, MarTechers. My name is Juan Mendoza from the MarTech Weekly. And this week on the MarTech Podcast, we're going to discuss B2B tech content marketing challenges and MarTech commoditization. Joining me is Joe Zappa. He's the CEO and founder of Sharp Pen Media, which consists of Wall Street Journal reporters, CMOs, Ivy League PhDs, renowned business writers, and veteran content strategists. The North Star is to transform you into your customer's only option through a bespoke three-stage approach to content marketing and public relations. As we go through this conversation, we'll go through those three stages as well and talk about how Joe Zappa and his team have this unique approach to driving content, media relations, and ultimately attention and conversions for your brand. But before we get into that, our first topic is the problems with B2B tech's content marketing approach. I'm sure there's many problems. So here is my conversation with Joe Zappa. He's the CEO and founder of Sharp Pen Media. How you doing, Joe? Hey, Juan. I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's lovely to have you here. And thanks for joining me in your evening. I know you've got a football game to catch soon, so we'll get you to that. But let's dive into this conversation, the problems with the B2B tech's content marketing approach. Now, could you set the scene for us a little bit here and give us some of the common challenges that B2B tech companies face in their content marketing strategies? How do they overcome those? But let's start in the problem space first. What challenges do you see? So I think the two biggest problems are, first, that people are too product-centric, and second, that they're not differentiated enough. Let's talk about the first one. So we work with tech companies. Generally, a lot of them have technical leaders. They're very excited to tell us about the differences between their product, which is completely understandable. Because when you're immersed in your product, you're a CDP and you're looking at all the other CDPs and you're like, they have all these flaws and they're not serving our customers in the best way. And we have this, that, and the other feature that's going to make our product better for them. But the problem is that it's very hard to make that sticky for the audience. Like one, most people at any given time are not in the market for a CDP, even if they are your ideal buyer. So they don't necessarily want to read a breakdown of your product features and how they differ from another product's features. And two, you're not going to reach anyone outside of your like immediate target market if all of your content is just about your product. So the way we get beyond that or the way any MarTech company can get beyond that is to make its story and its content valuable to the audience beyond the scope of its own product. For example, one of my collaborators is Mark Johnson, who is the CMO of Bambora, which is a B2B intent data company. And what Bambora does is they help their customers understand what their own prospects are reading and engaging with. What does my audience really want to know about? And how can I grab their interest? But Bambora didn't tout all the time just how good their B2B intent data was. They would produce content around the theme of sustainable marketing. And the idea was everyone in marketing and sales were getting slammed with messages. People want to sell stuff. It's annoying. You never even want to open your LinkedIn inbox. 
sustainable marketing is the idea that you use data to understand what people actually want to know about. And then you talk about that instead of just haranguing them with details about your product. So the first thing is that, that you have to make it about a bigger theme and something going on in the space, not just about the details of your product. The second is commoditization, which is no matter how different you think your product is from other products in the same category, there are probably a lot of similarities and it's hard to get people to remember those differences. So you have to come up with ways to make your product memorable beyond just someone has these seven features and our features are a little different. A lot of this resonates with me, Joe, because I think a lot of B2B product marketing is extremely pragmatic. Like it's extremely practical. These are the features. This is what you can do with it. Here's a case study. Here's an X amount ROI that this customer has got. All of that stuff's practical. And of course you need that in your mix. But I think often B2B marketers tend to be very practical because they think their buyers are very practical. Where I actually think to your point, being memorable and eliciting an emotional reaction and having that salience, that's the stuff of great marketing. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I guess there are two things there. The first thing is just that, yes, like those case studies, they're the first content anyone should create. Like if you're just starting to hire a content person or you've never produced content for your company before, your early stage maybe, the first thing you should do is create that bottom of funnel content so that when your sales team is talking to someone or someone's on your site and they're highly interested, you can convince them to buy, right? You can push them from consideration to a decision. But the vast majority of people who are going to interact with you at any given time are not in the market like that. You or me, Juan, like if we're reading about a new MarTech company, we might glance at a case study just to get a sense of like, okay, what do these people do? But because we're not an immediate buyer, we don't really care about their ROI was 76% or whatever. We really want to know, what are you about? Why do you exist? And that's the sort of more top of funnel content that companies need to produce to get the attention of people who are outside that 3% or whatever it is who are immediately ready to buy. I agree. That aspect of, yeah, how do you move users through a funnel, like get their attention, show up, and then actually get them to a point of consideration, and then you're helping them convert. You're basically helping them make the decisions by giving them the relevant content. All of that is so obviously helpful. And I love your point there about Starting from square one, like your first day, that stuff is absolutely critical. It's a real foundation for everything you do. But again, I would say a lot of B2B just don't have that vision that really not just makes people compelled to have a look at the product, but get them excited about what is possible with this particular technology. It's fantastic. The the example you gave Ben Bombora earlier about how they do that is fascinating. But I guess at the core of this, a lot of it actually has to do between aligning your audience needs and their pain points with what you actually solve, making that alignment, understanding it and making that alignment. But what happens when that alignment is missing? Like what are the problems or the anti-patterns that are introduced when a solution is not very aligned at all with the actual pain points or the problems? Well, I think there are two separate issues here. Like what I always tell prospects who are talking to me, should I invest in content and PR, is there are two things you need to have settled before you start pumping out content. One is do you have product market fit? If you don't, like if you're an early stage company and you have five customers, pumping out content cannot solve that problem for you. Usually the way companies in our space get their first 10, 20 customers is founder-led sales. It's networking. It's sort of like in the weeds. And then they have the privilege through acquiring, scrapping for those 10 to 20 initial customers of understanding who really is our ideal customer, with whom is our content going to resonate, and what kind of content should we create to resonate with them. But before you have that, before you have that product market fit, you can't really pump out content because you don't know to whom you're speaking or what you should be saying to them. The second thing, and I think this goes to your point, is marketing strategy. So once you obtain that product market fit, then it's time to analyze your customers and say, what really resonates with them? And how is that then going to translate into the content we produce? And if you don't have that analytical strategic understanding of what are our messages, which messages resonate with our customers and how do they differentiate us from our competitors, 
the content you produce is going to fall flat. My favorite example of this in MarTech, and I'm sure you've seen the same thing as a content guy in the space, is everyone and their mom has written a byline about the death of the third party cookie. (laughs) But like, no one cares. Like, no one cares what you have to say about that if all you're going to say is collect first party data. Everyone has said that. So if you're a CDP or DMP or whatever, and you're like, we need to do thought leadership. Let's write about the death of the third party cookie. It's not going to get you anywhere because you're just going to sound the same as everyone else. So you also need that understanding of what's our differentiated message and does it resonate with our customer? Yeah, I would say two things to that. I would say that you can take a boring message and you can spin it or like a message that everyone else is saying and then say it differently. So there's always, I think there's infinite opportunities to say the same message in a different variation, which is more relevant or helpful or engaging or funny, you know, or introduces levity. That's the first thing, but also just sheer consistency. Uh, What's your view on consistency in content marketing, where perhaps you got this message and you just hammer away at it consistently? I see that particularly with Twitter and a lot of people that grow audiences on Twitter, they are just consistent with what they're trying to do in the industry, like every day, you know, it's the same thing, but they say the same message, but in a variety of different ways all the time. What's your view on consistency? Consistency is vital. And what I think most non-marketers miss here is that you're going to feel, let's say you're the evangelist or you're the CEO and you're talking to press and you're talking to customers and you're on Twitter and you're hitting the same messaging points every day. You're going to get sick of your message because you're immersed in it day in and day out. But your customers and your audience and the media, they're not paying attention to you every day. You're lucky if they pay attention to you once a week. So it takes that sort of message discipline and that consistency to really become known for whatever crusade it is that your marketing is trying to promote. I think it's one of those things is that you may not see an outcome straight away. And the difference between virality and, say, really successful content marketing is like chalk and cheese, in my view. Like you could have huge virality and have something get spread across the internet. One example was actually when years ago when I was working for a tech startup, we launched this new product and we did this launch video with this influential content marketing organization. And we reached 3 million people, got zero sales over a period of 12 months. But virality is one part in the sharing and the saliency and the relevancy of the content. However, don't bet for those viral big hits actually consistently showing up every single day or every week or whatever cadence you're on could actually lead to far greater returns because you're just reminding people constantly. There's a fine line between reminding people and annoying people that you need to walk. But it's a great point you raised that, yeah, if you want to really drive an audience, you just have to show up consistently. Yeah, virality has a role in content marketing and PR because when you go viral, you do have a chance to get the attention of a much broader audience and not all of them will be relevant and not all of them will stay, but some will. And then maybe they interact with your more meaningful content. But generally, the stuff that goes viral is a hot take on like HR issues because everyone in the world can relate to it or a meme. You don't need to be a master of memes to do B2B marketing effectively. Because the thing is, yeah, you might reach a lot of people and it's humorous and that's good. It's not a bad thing to do. But ultimately, the stuff that is really going to drive business outcomes is if you're known as an authority in the space. And the way you get there is by providing value to your audience over and over again. And apropos of the consistency and the difficulty of sticking with the content marketing strategy for the long term, Recently, I'm sure you wrote about it, there was this huge dust up regarding Google and this ad tech research firm called Adalytics. They produced this report saying a lot of personalized YouTube ads were running on made for kids channels when they weren't supposed to. And I spoke recently for my own newsletter to Christoph Franizek, who's the CEO of Adalytics. And what Christoph was saying is, yeah, these reports that we do, which are like 200 page, super intensive, rigorous research reports, they seem great, right? Because they get written up in the Times or the Journal or whatever. And everyone is in the space is talking about analytics, which is awesome. But what he said is before those reports started taking off and generating huge media cycles, there were tons of them that took a ton of time and basically no one paid attention to them. My point is that when you are providing value and you're using the data in your own platform to educate people about the space and help your target audience do their jobs better, 
most of it is not going to go viral. None of it may go viral. And it may take a while to catch on. But what you need to look for are just like leading indicators that you're starting to resonate with some people and that it's building over time. And you need to like not expect to go from 20 Twitter followers to 10,000 in six months. It builds up over time. And if you provide that value and you see it's resonating with people, you will see returns from it ultimately. Yeah, I think that's the point. It's more of an investment in how you want to be perceived by your customers in your media and media as well. It's an investment. And sometimes investments take a long time. But once you get that ball rolling and then you've built that really strong, like I look at, for example, HubSpot, their content marketing, and they're kind of hailed as the champions of SEO. Because you search for something related to marketing, there's a chance that HubSpot's going to show up on page one at, at, all, at all stages, no matter what you're looking for in marketing. And I think they just really nailed it because they've just been consistent. They've on a schedule, they've got a plan, and they do it. And then they were at the right time when the internet was still very early to start that. But it doesn't mean you can't start today and be consistent. I think, uh, interesting, do you think this is a common misconception in B2B is that a lot of marketers try to do the big bang, the big thing over a lot slower cadence instead of that regular humdrum consistently? Like, is that an anti-pattern or is there some validity in doing the big showcase launches, things like that? I think the problem is that when you do the big launch, what will happen often in our industry is a company will say, we're going to have our Series A announcement, right? So now we've got to go out and get a PR firm. But it's very hard to get the attention you want for that quote unquote big announcement if you haven't been doing the gradual work of building an audience in the first place. Like the press is way more likely to cover you if you've been providing value to the press by helping them understand your industry and tell better stories over months and years. People in the industry who are not your immediate customers are way more likely to care when you have a big announcement if you've been providing value to them for months or years. So that's the problem with relying on that big announcement. Definitely, it's not a dichotomy. One works really well with the other. That's a great thing to keep in mind. Well, that wraps up our first episode of the MarTech Podcast with Joe Zappa, the CEO and founder of Sharp Pen Media. Thank you very much for joining us. In part two of our interview, which we'll publish tomorrow, definitely catch it. Joe and I are going to discuss a very different topic, but I think we'll have a little bit of overlap, which is can MarTech avoid commoditization? If you can't wait until our next episode, you'd like to learn more about Joe, you can find a link to his LinkedIn profile in our show notes. You can also DM him on Twitter at Joe underscore Zappa or lowercase, or visit his website at sharppenmedia.com. Thanks for joining me, Joe. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks to our guest host, Juan Mendoza, the author of the MarTech Weekly Newsletter. If you'd like to get in touch with Juan, you can find a link to his LinkedIn profile in our show notes, or you can contact him on Twitter. His handle is Juan Mendoza, but it's spelled crazy pants. It's J-U-4-N-M-E-N-D-0-Z-4. Or it's a little easier to just visit his company's website, which is themartechweekly.com. Just one more link in our show notes I'd like to tell you about. If you didn't have a chance to take notes while you were listening to this podcast, head over to martechpod.com where we have summaries of all of our episodes and contact information for our guests. You can also subscribe to our weekly newsletters and you can even send us your topic suggestions or your marketing questions, which we'll answer live on our show. Of course, you can always reach out on social media. Our handle is martechpod, M-A-R-T-E-C-H-P-O-D on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Or you can contact me directly. My handle is Ben J. Shap, B-E-N-J-S-H-A-P. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you want a daily stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, we're going to publish an episode every day this year. So hit the subscribe button in your podcast app and we'll be back in your feed tomorrow morning. All right, that's it for today. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. Thank you.